Good morning. Good morning. Well, once again, we have Gator Franklin here with us, uh, and I'm Dr. Ken Brown, and this is Glimmer of Hope podcast. Welcome, wherever you're watching this program from. Gator, it's so nice to, to see you today, and I, I'm really excited to hear your testimony of how you came to know Jesus. And uh, I know you're a complicated man, you've done a lot of things, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, your background is so interesting, so I know that you're going to have an interesting testimony as well. So I'm all ears. How did you come to know the Lord? Give you just a little background first. I did come to the Lord at a very early age, at 11, but before then, I, my, my father for my family was not a candidate for Father of the Year. Uh, there were many instances of uh, spousal abuse, and uh, I can remember being thrown up against the wall wow. and stuff like that. Wow. Uh, he was a very lazy guy and did not work, so my mother had three jobs to support us. I'm telling you this because that established kind of the way I am, is I looked at my father at some point and I said, I do not want to be like that. So I didn't turn out that way. But at age 11, the church I was going to, uh, Sulphur Springs Assembly of God in Tampa, they had a contest for world's, selling world's finest chocolate. Whoa. We did not uh, have the money to be able to send me to camp, I think, at the time. Don't quote me, but I'll say it was between 15 and $30 for the summer camp. And that was quite a bit of money back in 1964, 63. So they would sponsor whoever sold the most of world's finest chocolate. I did sell the most, and so I got to go. So there is, uh, <laughs> there's God working right there. Because when I went to the summer youth camp, I got saved. Um, I went down at the... Saved by chocolate. Saved I kind of like that. <laughs> saved by chocolate, yes. Uh, world's finest chocolate. <laughs> world's finest, of course. <laughs> uh, so I got saved at 11. From that point on... I, much like everything in my life, I was all in. I was going to church and things. My family was not. We lived about seven miles from the church, and I would walk to the church and walk back on both Sundays and Wednesdays, and then Fridays I was part of Royal Rangers and things. And so I literally was trying to learn as much as I could and be a good Christian fellow. The problem was, and always has been, my own pride and my own uh, selfishness would get in the way as, as I was trying to be a good Christian. I felt that I was called to be a preacher at that time. Uh, pastor even let me preach from the pulpit on Wednesday nights. What age? Uh, this was when I was 13. Wow. So I was uh, doing that, but then because I felt like I should have kind of given up some of the other things I was doing, I did not. I was a sports fanatic, and I, I played every sport that you could do, and I was, was very good at it. But being a preacher... And playing sports seemed to be a little bit of a con conflict. So I played sports. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as time went on, I moved, actually was in uh, Tampa, and my parents moved to California my senior year of high school. And... Actually, my junior year, my junior year. So I stayed with the next door neighbors to finish out my junior year. I would go with them to California for my senior year uh, during the summer 
but come back to that high school. I was playing football. I was on the football team, doing all that kind of stuff. That didn't work out because I, uh, my buddy who was living there, he was required to study a lot. He was every every night he had to study, and I never did. Right. So I was passing very well without studying, and he had to study to be able to pass. So I was a bad influence on him. So they wouldn't let me come back my senior year. So I stayed out in California. Once I was out there, to show you an example of me being self-centered and, and things, even though I knew the Christian way, is I ended up getting a girl pregnant. And uh, there was a child out of wedlock. I never knew him at the time, but I knew about him. But she put him up for adoption. She was a lot smarter than me. When I offered to marry her, she said that was not the reason that we should be married. So I'm giving you kind of a little history here. And so he was put up for adoption. And then from that point, I uh, played college football. I did other types of things. But mainly, I was self-centered. I went through different periods of time to where eventually I met this other lady, moved to Missouri and got married to her. And then uh, fast forward, I started two businesses, a blasting business where I blew up rock for water lines, sewer lines and things, and then a theater business. Throughout all of this, I was kind of straddling the fence. I was trying to be a good Christian man, but yet, once again, my pride and my self-centeredness always seemed to get in the way. I ended up selling those two businesses, going into the Navy, and was in the Navy for 28 years doing explosive ordnance disposal. Many different stories of taking bombs apart and doing all types of things. But during that time, I will say that I, again, was trying to be a Christian man. I let it know, be known to everybody I was a Christian. But yet, I was not living 100% as a Christian. The, here's a part that I'll tell you that some people have a little trouble with in theology for my testimony. And that is, there was a time when I was tired of God disciplining me for me being the way I was and things were not going good and stuff. And I knew it was him disciplining me and I wasn't living right. So literally one day, one night while I was driving, I told God, there's the key right there, my arrogance. I told God to get out of my life. I said, I do not want to be a Christian anymore. I'm tired of being disciplined. I want to live my life. I want to do what I want and how I want to do it. Get out. And guess what? He did not. He would not leave. Because he promises that he will never leave nor forsake us. And he tells us that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So in my arrogance, I was telling God what to do. And God was loving me. And saying, my child, my child, I'm here for you. Come back to me. The prodigal can run as far as he wants. <laughs> but his father was on that road looking down there for his son. You know, the, 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 the prodigal left the father, but the son never left to the father's heart. So, yes. That's uh, so beautiful. Yes. Yeah, I like that. So I did repent. I did come back. And since that time... A lot of good things, Romans 8, 28, for, for all things work together for good mm -hmm. to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. The child that was given up for adoption that I never knew, never knew his name, never knew anything, 48 years later, he contacted me. And we have since built a relationship up. It's fantastic. That's beautiful. The, the, his family and our family and, and I... 
I have not tried to replace his dad. He, he grew up and had a good family life, but I have worked it out with him and that I'm an addition, that I'm a help, that I'm a comfort to him. And we've built a great relationship. We've met each other several different times. And I love his family and his family loves mine. That's just an example of what God has done. So now in my testimony, I've gotten finished Navy for 28 years. I worked for the VA for seven years as a disability raider. I couldn't get the desire to serve out of my blood. And uh, then since I've retired from that, I've been in doing motorcycle ministry, uh, going to where the bad boys are. They don't go to church, so we would go to them. I've been in, uh, do a lot of different security for a lot of events and things. When I was in the Navy, I did a lot of uh, secret service work for presidents, vice presidents, heads of state, things like that for security. So I've been involved in doing those kinds of things. I do a little singing and acting and stuff like that. Still, that's in my blood. And the thing I want to really say for this particular moment is this. One time, I was seeking God's face and asking him things. And Micah 6, 8, I was reading that, says... Um, uh, son, the things I want for you is to do my word, which is good, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before your God. That's right. So I asked God, I said, okay, that sounds great, Lord. I want to do that. But what specifically do you want me to do? And he told me, and I've got many different stories of things like this, but he told me this as just like you're talking to me right now. He told me, said, I want you to do whatever is needed. So that's how I've been going since then. So you've been on secret service assignments on, a, on mission ever since. Ever since. That's right. <laughs> now, of course, your, your story is not, I mean, I thought you're supposed to get be introduced to the Lord sometime you go to church the pastor says, kumbaya, just as I am. You're supposed to come to the front, say the sinner's prayer, sign mm -hmm. a church card, right? And from then on, you don't have any more problems, <laughs> you know, because you're a Christian. You know, you ask Jesus into your heart. In fact, I was talking to someone, and they were saying to me just recently, she says, Dr. Brown, I can't believe it. Ever since I've become a Christian, I seem to have more problems, <laughs> not less. And I said, well, your story is your story. Your testimony is your testimony. Mm -hmm. God makes each of us different. Like every snowflake is different, every fingerprint, every iris. If we're all different with our DNA. Mm -hmm. And is it ever any wonder that he's dealing with you in a unique way? And what, one of the things that just jumps out at me is this highlight of the faithfulness of God. One of my favorite <laughs> verses is that even though we're not faithful, he is faithful. Oh, yes. He's yes. faithful and we were faithless. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that jumps out of you is because I think it's sort of like kids, right? You love your kids to the moon and back, even though they may mess up, they may, you know, they may cause you grief. There may be periods of time when you're close to them, other times when you're not close to them. And so I often have thought about that prodigal father in the story uh. you just told us and how basically that young boy couldn't wait for his father to die. And so he says, give me what you get. <laughs> Even though you're not dead yet, give it all to me now. Mm -hmm. And then he left his father's home. He left his father's heart. He went and followed his own heart, his own way. But he was still in his father's heart. I mean, the story was when he finally came back to his senses, I know what I'll do. I'll go back home. <laughs> and I'll say, I'm not worthy to be your son. Yes, yes. <laughs> just, just make me a servant. But when he got down there, he, there was his father. Day after day, year after year loving his son, obviously praying for his son, looking for his son mm -hmm. on that road and recognized his son just like that in the distance. He ran to his son uh. and hugged his son. See, that boy couldn't escape the father's heart. <laughs> and not. when it says that, you know, no one can can take them out of our, my hand, 
that's where I, I said this. I think I told you this, Gator. I said, you know, even when we were doing this taping today, mm -hmm. oh, I guess we're in God's hands because we had a little <laughs> technical difficulty with the, yeah. the, the... But you know what? That's the best place to be is the Father's hand. The only place. The only place. So you are in the Father's hand. So your story is one of faithfulness. But I do have a question for you. Yes, sir. You know what? What were some of the challenges that the wounds, the hurts that you were having in your life? And then, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about how God helped you. You know, practically, what difference did it make in being a Christian? You know, what? How did He help you with some of those things? So, what one of the challenges was I mentioned my father, right, and uh, not being a candidate for Father of the Year. So. For many, many, many years, and I'm talking over 30, mm -hmm. I literally held hate in my heart for my father. And as time went on, I was talking with some other very godly people, mm -hmm. and somehow or another that subject of forgiveness and fathers and things came up. And I guess it was time, and I spilled it out, that the, I was harboring hate for my father. And we talked and stuff, and I finally was able to forgive him after all those years for the way he was. Now, I never was able to reconcile with him, never saw him again, never talked to him again. But the point is, there was a... It was like a, almost like a cancer that was in me that I was able to get lifted off when I forgave him for what he did. And I learned forgiveness is what has to happen. Always. That was one of the challenges as I gave that up and was forgave him another challenge is I mentioned that I knew I didn't want to be like him well my stepfather he was an alcoholic and without going into big long detail he and I never got along and but I learned from him that I did not want to be like him so God has blessed me with evaluating a situation and then me making a decision to say this is what I'm going to do and this is not what I'm going to do. And I think maybe you know this better than almost anybody that I would know. Some people become what happened to them. I was just the opposite. I was not going to become what happened to me. People have said that hurting people hurt people. But that's a truism. A truism is something that sounds true, but isn't always true upon close inspection. People that have been hurt are the ones that could also hurt people. But a lot of times people, when they're hurt, they stay a victim. It's like a pie mm. with four sections. They start by being a victim because they've been hurt by someone, in this case, your father. And they have a choice to go left or right. If they go left, they go offside and they become an abuser, replicating what the father did to them. Mm -hmm. But you made a choice not to do this. You also made a choice not to stay in the section of pie called victim. So you didn't want to go over to the section of pie called abuser. And so you went to the section of pie called survivor. But then something happened to you. When you forgave your father, you went to become a healer. You went to become a servant. You, you became a thriver. And so you moved away, as far away as you can from being an abuser. You did not stay being a victim. Uh, victim does not describe the gator, the man I know. <laughs> You're not just a survivor, although you did survive. You ended up intentionally not becoming like your father, 
forgiving your father and became a venue of help for many people. And so that's a wonderful thing about your story is that you didn't stay stuck. You didn't stay a victim. You didn't slide into being an abuser like mm -hmm. your father at all. In fact, there's, it's a story of you know, growth, moving away from being a victim, moving away, becoming a survivor, and then moving out of that even to being a people helper, a servant of God. Now, the other thing I wanted to note is there's something interesting in your story. As a clinician, as a counselor, I notice that there's a father wound that happens to a lot of people. In the study of salvation, it's called sociology. We often, dis we often discover, uncover, as we're talking to people, that something that's making them stuck and is keeping them away from God, and in fact, sometimes makes them rebel against God, like you mentioned, was because they had a wound in the father part of it. The part that was, I'm, a father is supposed to be the most loyal, the most faithful, the person that is the most unconditionally loving. So when God was correcting, you always, as you discussed with me before, always felt less than, you felt inferior, you felt like you failed. But God was not trying to make you feel condemned. He was trying to correct you because oh, you're yeah. a beloved son. And so a lot of times people that have this father wound, especially women that have been sexually abused by the male figures in their lives, they have a hard time coming to know the Lord. And one of the things they have to come to realize is that the heavenly father, is no way, in no way like those mm. broken images of the divine, of the Dios, yeah. of the image of God. They're, those fathers that they experience are in no way like that prodigal father that we're talking about, mm -hmm. like the, the, the loving father heart of God. So, so you found that, obviously. I do. And, and I, by the way, I appreciate your sensitivity, and I know you're a man of great passion, and, and you're controlling your feelings because... Stoism, we've discussed this. Stoism, mm -hmm. it seems to be our middle name, right, Gary Gator? <laughs> but here you are with this this deep heart. So, how did you discover the Father's love? You know, that's that's the thing I'm I'm interested in. How how did the the Father heart of God start to heal your heart? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I know this is not a secret, but literally. It's his word. I uh, I don't know why this happened, but I started writing in journals. You could call them journals. I would just start writing down the lessons I was learning, the scriptures I was learning, the classes I was taking, the uh, preaching that was I was sitting under, the books I was reading, the different... Uh, uh, theologies, the what other religions are, Christian apologetics, uh, all of those things. I just started writing in journals the things I was learning and the scriptures that I was looking up to back up the theology and to back up the verses, I mean, back up the, the topics and everything else. And I started doing that. And I've, I'm now on journal number seven. Uh, this has been for over 30 some odd years, 40 years. And I just, as I was writing these journals and stuff, I could go back and look at these journals. And I'd say, oh, yeah, I remember that class. Oh, yes, I remember this preaching. I remember this book. And God was teaching me. But one thing I asked God, I said, Lord, why am I doing this? I'm not a preacher. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not some type of a uh, prophet, teacher, apostle, whatever. Fivefold ministries and things. I'm none of those. So why am I doing this? Now I know. Because God was preparing me and teaching me, sanctifying me. And as I went through and was not doing some of the things that I was, should have been doing, he would remind me. And now I, then I can go back into these journals and I could bring this back. And I have, I have hundreds of teachings that I could do because God was preparing me. That's how, that is how I am where I am today. It's because 
I was reading the word, I was writing things down. Don't let me make you think that I was some studious guy that was always doing that because I was, I was everywhere doing everything. But I, if I was anywhere where knowledge was to be gained, I wrote it down. And in fact, one of the things that you shared with me, you brought those seven journals and we spent a breakfast looking <laughs> at them. And I was astonished about the depth of it, in very small printing. I yeah. it. And it was very clear and legible writing. Uh, my writing is so messy, comparatively speaking. <laughs> you know, doctor's handwriting, <laughs> I can't read it. But yours were incredibly legible and, and the topics were breathtaking. It's, it's like you're this dazzling comet with this long tail, <laughs> you know, and so you have, you bring that with you and, and there's a richness to you. And it's interesting. And I, you had mentioned the theological confundrums, you know, the fact that it's kind of unusual because here you were for 40 years writing a journal and at times you were following him more or less uh, <laughs> successfully at times right. according to your own words. Yeah. And, uh, and yet here the Lord never let go of you. Never. The Lord was always teaching you. And we call that, you know, the heart of a learner. You know, um, I know when I'm talking to people, you can always put people into two piles. You can people that people that are closed and people that are open. And um, it's kind of like, you know, people either are open and God can pour into them or they're closed. And you can pour all you want on them and it doesn't work. Nothing is penetrating. Now, sometimes I think you were primarily like this and maybe once in a while <laughs> <laughs> your cup was on the end. Yeah. But, but the fact is, is your journals tell the story that you had a teachable heart mm. and you were listening to God. And in fact, that's one of the things I saw about you when I first met you, Gator. And that's one of the reasons also why I guess incredible treasure that you carry inside you. Uh, you know, I wanted you on the board as our vice president because of that. I also want you to hold me accountable because I know you've got the goods, <laughs> the real goods. But, uh, but I, I appreciate you because of that. I appreciate the fact that God's been working in you a long time. The other thing I like is that there's, you're not proud about it. It's like sometimes people that go to cemetery Oh, I mean sem seminary. <laughs> seminary, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they get very arrogant, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but here it is that God has been teaching you line by line, precept by precept. He's been teaching you in the experiences, these rather in-depth, cataclysmic, actually, some of these experiences you've had. And so I know that God's, you know, got you and he's using you and he's, he's working in you. And, uh, and, uh, but the main thing is that there's a, a love that you have for people and a willingness to serve like few people I've met. And I think it has to do with your military background when you say that you're all, all in. And I think that God is looking for people like that. People that, you know, people say it's not, you know, God's not looking for ability, he's looking for availability. But mm -hmm. I don't think he's just availability. He's looking for availability with heart, with passion. And, and that's, so somehow you, you got that. And it's, and it's, I know that comes from, what do we have that doesn't come from the Lord? Nothing. Nothing. The Lord is the one that's working in this. And, uh, and I just know for a fact that God is at work in you. I was reading um, something that I thought was kind of interesting. And uh, I thought it might sum up this conversation. And it says in uh, Ecclesiastes, 12, 13. Ah, well, I this is it. the whole story. There's the, the whole man. story. And here's my final conclusion. Fear God, obey his commands, because it's everyone's duty. duty. That's the whole story. Now, this is my final conclusion for this podcast. So we have to fear God. Amen. We got to obey his commands. Get his commands deep inside us. Because that's everyone's duty is to serve God, to love God, to honor God, to bring glory to him, to follow him, to obey him. And I, I Micah Pastor is one of my favorites, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, that you quoted, of course. You know, what what does God require of you then? Yes. To, to, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before the Lord your God. Amen. And I think that, that 
a lot of times we think, oh God, how am I supposed to go left or right? Which Bible college? Who should I marry? I mean, what, you know, what should I preach on today? I mean, like all those are good questions, but I think God is more concerned about the inside of us, the willingness to follow him, the willingness to obey him, the fact that we, that we love people, we, we, we're kind and we're merciful like Jesus, that we, we want to be fair and do the right thing, and that we have this humility inside, knowing that we blow it, knowing that we can't do one right thing, we can't do anything good unless we have God living in our life. And Can I say something yeah. there? You just touched on something that really made me think about this, and that is when we walk humbly before God, that is not self deprecating that is doing what we know to do without seeking the glory and the spotlight but do it as often as we can but it is not Mm self-deprecating but it's lifting him up and that's in fact what we want to do so why don't we invite you if you're listening to this podcast we're just going to invite you to pray we're not asking you to become a cookie cutter christian or sign in the dotted line or you know join at the church and give your 10 percent and make sure you're there whenever the doors are open we're more interested in that you get to experience the god the gators come to know even when he did his best to run for him from <laughs> sometimes <laughs> but if god was still corralling him lassoing him teaching him and now using him more than ever that's a God that you can know too. You might not have had an abusive father, or maybe you did. But one thing is, your Heavenly Father is not like Gator's father. He's not like some of these men that have hurt people. He's loving. He's kind. He's quick to forgive. He's mm-hmm. long-suffering. And He loves you. He knows you. He made you. So, I'm just going to say a prayer for you. If you want, just turn your eyes to Him. Those inside eyes that you have inside your eyes. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, have mercy on us. Have mercy on anyone that's looking at this podcast. Lord, touch their hearts. Help them to come to know the good, kind, and loving Heavenly Father. Help them to come to know you and your Father's heart and how much you love them. And Lord, I pray that you begin to work in your own special way and each person that's here, that's listening to us today. And Lord, we ask that you bless them encourage them, heal their hearts, and help them to get to know you, and save them, Father. Help them to throw themselves onto you. And Father, we just ask that you would do what you do best. Bring us into relationship through Jesus Christ, into your kingdom. So Lord, I just pray for everyone. And Lord, I just ask that you would bless them. Bless each one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, brother, enjoyed hearing your testimony. God bless you. I absolutely love the time we get to spend together. God bless you.